we'll see what we look like and see how far behind we are. There we go. Cool. All right, let's start. All right, we're officially live. That's awesome. All right, that's the public view. Okay, cool. Here we go. And we're officially on the Google Hangouts. Okay. So, welcome everybody to the first training of 2018. And for everybody on YouTube, welcome. And Google Hangouts, welcome. And uh, everybody else, welcome. Um, it's 2018. And to the beautiful, beautiful thing about the new year is how much potential it offers. And it, it's so exciting starting every year knowing that it's a clean slate. We can do whatever we like. And having the right mindset, especially to start off the beginning of the year, is so important. You know, if you start off the year in a funk, that's not ideal. Um, on the flip side, if you start it in the right frame of mind, it could be your best year ever every single year. And so that's what I kind of wanted to talk about today. And um, big things that I, I kind of wanted to throw out more than anything are actually questions. So um, I wanted to start off, very first thing is um, a guy named David Goggins. Uh, can you fix that? There we go. Uh, can you hit play one already? Um, David Goggins is he's made a name for himself. The guy is a Navy SEAL. He's been through everything. He holds several world records for kind of like endurance things. I, um, forgive me, I need to brush up a little more on him. He spoke at the Tom Ferry Summit uh, this summer. Um, he's been all over the place. And so um, it's a really cool video to kind of go through. Forgive me, uh, not forgive me, but he is a little bit of a potty mouth. So bear with him on that one. He is a Navy SEAL. <laughs> so, uh, there we go. Let's go ahead and play that really fast. Down the stairs, just dragging her. And she was kind of lifeless. And that's when I got off the couch, scared to death, jumped up my father, and he beat the shit out of me. But he never heard the story hardly at all. Because it was from his blood. He also believed me just by working the family business. So, for going to school really didn't happen for me at all. Now I didn't take it back, he also had a learning disability. I never was getting third grade, there was this teacher. That was extremely rough on me. At this time in my life, I did not need this. And she believed I needed to be in a special school because of my learning disability. And this is what I was talking about. People are talking about manage your expectations. This teacher managed my expectations. She saw I had a learning disability. She saw I was socially unable to survive in this world. She saw I was messed up. So she managed my expectations. She said, we need to put David Goggins in a special school. I came from hell. And when you come from hell not knowing how to fight, this is what happens to you. What happens to you is you become a fucked up kid that cannot survive in society. I'll never forget one time during a basketball game, there was this coach, Mr. Trout. He knew me when I was a kid in that school when I was in third grade getting set back. Mr. Trout always loved me. This white man loved the shit out of me. I don't know why he did but he was my JV basketball coach my sophomore year. The visiting team was at our home stadium. It was at the end of the game, and the visiting team started chanting, I was the only black person in the whole daggone stadium. They started chanting, nigger, nigger, nigger. That's all I remember. At that time in my life, that's all I remember. But not 42 years old. I can look back at that time with clear eyes, in a clear mind, and see what Mr. Trout did for me. He went in that locker room where I was crying and upset, and he cried with me. This white man cried with me, but at that time, I didn't see that. All I saw was red. I saw hate. This whole town hated me. Everybody's against me. My mind lost it. And for some reason, I couldn't sleep on my bed. And to this day, I don't know why the floor felt so comfortable. And at 22, 21 years old, I went from 175 pounds to 297 pounds. Fat, out of shape, insecure. I was everything everybody said I was going to be. That's what I was. And it makes you feel like shit. So I got a job spraying for cockroaches.
coaches at nighttime. Not saying it's a bad job, but I didn't want to do it. So about six months, I went around to your local eatery spraying for cockroaches. This one night I came home, the first thing I do, I walk in my living room, turn the TV on. First thing I do, then walk back to the um, to take a shower. And I would listen to the TV as I was trying to take a shower. This day changed my life. It held me accountable for what I wasn't facing in life. They're going through Navy SEAL training. And I sat down. I, I came out of the shower and I sat down. Something brought me back to sit down and watch these guys go through hell. I saw a ton of them quit ringing the bell. Ringing the bell means you quit Navy SEAL training. I saw them putting their helmet down. This went on through the whole show. And it finally got to the very end. There's about 15 to 20 guys in the very end. And this one statement changed my life. They were all sitting there in their dress whites. And this CEO, this commanding officer, stands up in front of these men. And he looked sharp. And he I can tell he stood for something. And he said, we live in a world where mediocrity is often rewarded. These men up here detest mediocrity. When you hear a statement like that, it forces you to think about yourself. I wasn't even fucking mediocre. I wasn't anything. I was at the bottom of the barrel of life. I chose the four-lane highway for my life, the easy route. The route that has gas stations. The route that has fucking signs that say 20 miles to the next service stop. All this shit. I chose the right. Most of us choose the four-lane highway. When I was born, there was also a shovel over here in the fucking corner. That's the, no one wants to go to the shovel. They want to choose the four-lane fucking highway. That's the, that's the nice route. The shovel means you're going to fucking hurt. The shovel means you're going to suffer. The shovel means you're going to hit rock a lot of time. And we all know what digging through rock is like. When you hit a fucking root, you got to fucking get some more tools out. If I have no more tools, just a fucking shovel. I was choosing the four-lane highway. This is when I decided to pick up that fucking shovel that we all decided not to take. I had to make a change in my life. So I said, you know what? I have to join the military. I went on a Navy SEAL training. Became the only person I believe in history to go through three Navy SEAL helmets in one year. I completed two of them. Hell week is 130 hours of continuous training. You might get two hours of sleep. The first few weeks get you ready for this hard one week of training. I had to become obsessed. No matter what was in front of me, I had to figure out a way to overcome it. So when things hit you in life that you're afraid of or you're not good at, the first thing you're going to say to yourself is, why am I here anyway? This isn't for me. The water's too cold. The sun's too hot. I'm getting up too early. Why am I doing this to myself? That's what the normal mind says. I had to start training my mind to think about how the fuck can I get through this? Not giving myself a way out. Never giving myself, creating a wall around all the fucking ways out in my mind. I had to slowly start to build this fucking wall so my mind knew this motherfucker is not going to give himself a way out of here. In my first hell week, I had a huge setback. I was broken. My legs were broken. I had double pneumonia. I got rolled back to day one, week one of Navy SEAL training. I got through that second hell week. During that second hell week, I actually broke my knee. I continued to limp around for a couple weeks. I couldn't make it anymore. I got rolled back to day one, week one. I'll never forget standing there in front of Captain Bowen. He was the CEO in charge of Navy SEAL training at the time. And he had no mercy on anybody. If he believed in managing your expectations, I wouldn't be here today. He challenged me again. I was challenged my whole life, not by the mindset of managing expectations, by exceeding expectations, not by managing them. I'm standing there with crutches. I'm sitting in his office. He looks at me and goes, Doggy, this is your last time. We're going to put you through Navy SEAL training. This will be your third hell week in one year. We're not going to put you through a fourth. So this is your last time. I'm sitting there thinking, how am I going to get through this? I'm, I'm badly jacked up. 
my legs are broken, my knee is messed up. And he goes, give a couple of months to get better. A couple of months isn't going to do it. I won't get healed up in a couple of months. But I realized I'm going to get through this shit. I'm going to find a way to get through it because why? I put barriers in my mind. So my third hell week, I went in there with pretty much, I would put a black sock on first. I would get duct tape. And I duct taped my ankles all the way up to my calf every single morning. And then I put another black sock over it. And what that did, that prevented me from moving my ankle. So I didn't really, I, I wasn't flexing my shin as much. And I started running with just my hip flexors. And this Hell Week, it was a bad Hell Week. We had a guy die on Thursday morning of Hell Week. I went on to become a Navy SEAL. Greatness is not something that you meet once. It's something that you meet thousands of fucking times in your life. And you don't reach it if you're not constantly in constant fucking pursuit of fucking greatness. So if my mind were to say right now, I'm great, I just lost. We're going to grow. We're not going to triple down on our strengths. We're not going to do that crap. We're going to work on our weaknesses so we grow. We need friction to do that. Without friction, there's no growth. Without friction, there's confusion. Confusion is, David, God, is how did you become who you are today? I put a bunch of fucking friction in my life. And I grew. That's how I did it. You want to get really tough? It's a lifestyle. Instead of hitting that fucking snooze button in the fucking morning and not making your bed, not cleaning your house, you don't hit the snooze button. You get up. You don't want to go run? You go run. You don't want to go swim? You go swim. You don't want to make your bed? You make your bed. You don't want to clean your house? You clean your house. You don't want to study? You fucking study. That's how you start to callous your mind. So that became my life. If you say you're going to wake up at 4 o'clock in the fucking morning to go run, wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning. It's going to suck. It's not going to be fun. Do something that sucks every single day of your life. That's how you grow. Embrace the suck. <laughs> Embrace the suck. Exactly. And that that is what sum, sums up real estate. Because... We don't have anybody behind us on a daily basis making sure we we embrace the suck. It's really easy not to do the things we don't want to do, especially when you have nobody behind you saying, do it. So today I wanted to talk about a um, few different questions posing basically kind of what's the difference in your, in your opinion between a schedule and, for, and a ritual? And I'm kind of stealing this... Uh, from um well from uh oh shoot what's his name it's another uh another realtor in uh, myrtle beach forget his name but he he posed this um saw this in a video this week and so what is the difference between a schedule and a ritual a ritual would be a, something you plan on doing regularly maybe on certain times and uh, what what's the other schedule and a ritual Ritual remains the same. The schedule changes. Okay. <clears throat> Which one packs a little more punch? Schedule. See, I, I, I disagree on that one. I, I think ritual packs a little more punch. We schedule a lot of stuff. How often do we miss things? But when we have a ritual, how often are we going to miss our ritual? You know, For example, a ritual can be your cup of coffee in the morning. A ritual can be going to church on Sundays. A ritual can be praying before you eat. Um, making your bed. Making your bed. It's a ritual, right? It's something that it's it's part of you. If it's not met, your day's wrong. You know what I mean? Um, at this point, having your cell phone at your side is almost like a ritual. <laughs> you know, you feel naked without it. And he posed, as realtors, what are our rituals? What is something that has to happen no matter what, you know? And for most of us, I think the hard, the hard part is, you know, what is our niche? What should we be doing? And that's what should be our, our ritual. Unfortunately, we, we put a lot in our schedule, but half of what ends up on our schedule can get pushed to the next day 
or something pops up and it might take more more president more important so I wanted to take a few moments and kind of pick out a few things as agents what is our schedule and what what should be a ritual uh, like for example emails okay is answering emails is that a ritual or should that be scheduled in you know or as to what time per se I was listening to Dr. Jeremiah this morning on the way over, and he's talking about putting first things first and identifying those first things. And one of my first things is preparing me as a person for the day. That's through my faith in Jesus Christ. And studying His Word, and that's the high priority that I place. Yeah. Then everything else will follow after that. That's awesome. Your morning routine, your morning ritual is huge on how you set aside the rest of your day. You know, if you if you fulfill your morning routine, how much do you normally accomplish halfway through your day? On the flip side, when you don't meet it, how much do you accomplish by the end of your day? It's, it, seems like, it seems like what, what he might be saying is that maybe a ritual is looked at as something that is a vital part of your daily life. Of your routine. It's a, if yeah. it's a yeah. daily ritual. Yeah. It, it becomes a part of your life. Uh, it never means, you're never saying that you like it or you don't like it. Yeah. It might be either one, but if, if getting up, um, for example, one of the rituals that a, a burn victim in recovery has to get used to for perhaps even months is going into a a, a whirlpool bath. Yeah. It, it, it's something that <clears throat> it's regularly scheduled but they have to get the ritual says my mind accepts that as a part of what I need to do. Something scheduled says my mind has not yet accepted it so I need to schedule it and then you do it because it's on the schedule. The ritual says it's a part of my life. I will put everything else around this one. Yeah. And uh, for somebody that's healing like that, they have to make it a part of their life, otherwise they're just not going to heal. Yeah. Uh, for the realtor, uh, it, the email or following up, you know, it, it, it may start off as a schedule, but it needs to become a part of the life. Yeah. Well, and he, uh, man, I, I, I'm really bumming because I cannot remember his name because he put some really good points out there. He equated it to kind of like in the past. When they had rituals, oftentimes, and let's take it to the most basic stereotype, you know, let's say you have a tribe and they had to make a sacrifice or whatever it might have been. Was there going to be one person, no matter what situation they were in, that were going to miss that ritual or that ceremony or whatever it might have been? No way. They would be carrying people on their backs up the mountain to make sure they were there, to make sure that they were part of it, that it happened, you know? And he, he put it to that extent. And so, as agents, each of us have our own niches. That niche is your livelihood you know um, you're you might have a niche of having a little bit of everything right it might be a little bit of open houses it might be a little bit of online leads it might be a little bit of sphere but combine all of those that's your business okay so let's break this down then what is the most important thing and everybody's gonna be a little bit different but what is the most important thing right now that you can and should be doing Stealing a little bit of Gary Keller and the one thing here. Uh, what is the one thing you can and should be doing on a daily basis that is that will have the most impact on your life and your business? I think setting goals and not so many that they're unattainable, but something that you can reach for and be confident that you can attain those goals. And then schedule a plan and a program under each particular goal that you might set to get to it, and that'll create your ritual. I think, yeah, I think you're touching on it, and let's keep, let's keep hammering away. Create the plan, 
Absolutely, you have to have a plan. Then you've got to lay out what has to happen to achieve that plan or that goal, right? Exactly. So, but even then, right, let's make it even more specific. If you want to make $200,000 a year, you have to make, you know, a certain amount of, you have to make a certain amount of sales. And then in order to make those certain amount of sales, you have to do a certain amount of whatever it is to get to that point. And then to get to that point, you've got to do this. And then, you know, so keep breaking it down, breaking it down, break it down. What is the actual one thing in your business that is the most important? Um, Craig Harrelson, that's the guy's name. Um, and it's his group in uh, Myrtle Beach. That's what it is. I think it's Myrtle Beach. But they, um, they have made their ritual three hours of phone calls in the, in the morning. From basically eight to noon, the first half of their day is three hours on the phones making calls, prospecting. That, they've turned that into their ritual. And they've taken it to the extent even further where if they're going to be on the phone, let's say not 9 o'clock, not 10 o'clock, like a lot of agents, they're on the phones at 8 o'clock. And he, he also equated a great thing. I'm still in a bunch of his stuff because it was really good. Um, when does Michael Jordan, when did he show up to the Coliseum or to, to the arenas for his games? Did he show up at 7 o'clock because that's when it started? Or did he show up well early to prep, stretch, and practice ahead of time? So, would you say he was pretty much ready and at the peak of his performance by the time the show started, by the time the game started, tip-off? Sure. Absolutely. So, as agents, are we setting ourselves up for those wins? Right? And then again, comes back to the mindset. Number one... Are we doing it because it's part of us, because we know we need to and we're, we're happy about it? Or are we still scared? Are we in fear? Are we not, like, we're still trying to push it off, like, well, any little thing is going to let us come between. Oh, this popped up. I got to go here. Oh, this popped up. Because it's not easy to do those things. And after time, it, it, it becomes monotonous, redundant. You know, it, there's a lot of things that pop in our brain especially when it comes to prospecting, if that's going to be the number one thing on your list. So what is the one thing you should be doing? And if we can't, actually, you know, actually look at it. Let's write it down, your one thing. You know, whether it's property management, whether it's uh, listing homes, whether you're, uh, you're, whatever your niche is, what is the one thing that is the most important that day in and day out, if you do this, like you know you should and can be doing, it will have the most impact on your business. And take a few moments and think about it. Like, really, really think about it. You know, for me, I, I'd say as a broker, my one thing that is the most important thing, hmm, see, that's tough, I'm torn, because being there for the agents is important, but then also growing the brokerage too is very important. It's a tough one. And then on that level, what are we doing to make sure it happens? So my next question is, why is that most important? Because once you find the why, it'll really start setting in as the importance of it. And once you truly wholeheartedly believe that is what you need to be doing, it takes on a whole different perspective. So why is it so important? Is it that, number one, yeah, you'll make money, you'll make sales, but number two, is it providing for your family? Is that what's gonna allow you to take your family on vacation? Is that what's gonna allow you to retire like you need to? Why is doing that one thing so important? Most realtors aren't gonna retire. For me, that's a huge thing. I wanna put my daughter through school. I wanna retire at a somewhat younger age, hopefully. You know, provide for my family. It's huge. You know, I my daughter's 13. I have five more years before she's 18. So I have approximately five more family vacations with my daughter. I want to make every one of those as awesome as possible. That's part of my why. 
Okay, so once, once you have that, let's take the next one. This is where the visual, visualization comes in. Let's say you know you need to be making calls 90 days straight, right? Because in real estate, most of us deal in a 90-day window. What we do today is going to pay us back probably in March, right? So visualize. If you do make your calls 90 days straight, if you knock on doors 90 days straight, if you hold open houses five days a week, 90 days straight, well, five days a week for you know however long that breaks down. If you accomplish all those, like you know you need to, what can and will happen? Your results. Absolutely. But get down to it. If you're holding open houses, think about it. If you're holding open houses, you, you're capturing five people. You're following up like you're supposed to. You're not letting anybody fall through the cracks. You're not letting your one great open house prevent you from doing two more that week. You're not going to let that one bad open house burst your bubble and have a bad attitude for the rest of the week because it is the one thing day after day after day because we're not focused on the one thing because it's the one thing. We're focused on the why. We're focused on the impact it's going to have. That's what we'll overcome. Okay, so you do what you know you need to do. You knew you need, needed to make phone calls, and you're not going to let the people saying no affect you. You're not going to let them say, "Oh, we're just looking." We're not going to. We're not going to let them. Oh, we're we. You know, we're just we're up, we're neighbors up the street. We're just going to walk through. We're not going to let people get away with all their excuses. You know, we're not going to let somebody slam on the door and walk away, right? So what what can and will happen? For, let's see, um, my one of the immediate goals, you know, is to, uh, well, my first goal is to get up to 30 agents. At 30 agents, that will allow us to open our second office and have the volume that goes through that. And so I'm visualizing myself with several people here that we're at the new office. There's a bunch of people there. We're all excited because we actually, we didn't get to do it here, but we actually are having a ribbon cutting ceremony because we're going to open our new office. If I make my calls to the agents for the next 30 days, that will happen. What is it for you? Well, it would mean that whatever you envision is, is something that you desire that you can accomplish it. It's not necessarily, I mean, if we're doing all of these things, we'll have, we will achieve sales or, or get new clients. That, that will come as a result of everything. But if you look at that, then all you're visualizing is work. What you need to visualize is the result uh, of that. What am I going to be able to do? In your case, you're talking about a vacation or opening up another office. Um, that's really what's, nice. If you just visualize the work without any goal, that becomes old. What's yours? And so, you know, mine would be to have free time to be able to travel or just to be able to take on daily projects without being interrupted. You're in property management. That's never going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> but, but if, yeah, if you're, if you're, if you, Keep your goal in view, then the work becomes more bearable. It becomes Absolutely. more uh, something that says that when I achieve this, I get rewarded. Man. So the work will potentially give us the reward. But so I'll do the work. But if I if that's all there is to it, without some kind of established reward, then I don't know how much motivation we could sustain on that. Yeah. It's only going to tide you over for so long, you know. Um, there was the other sports analogy. Uh, I think it was Tom Ferry mentioned it the other day about uh, there's a reason uh, even sports teams have seasons. You know, they don't almost no sport competes year round. You know, and there's a reason they need they need time to recover. They need time to prep, get motivation, find their why. And businesses don't have that same luxury. You know, we go to work. How many? You know weeks and our vacations are our breaking our seasons 
and many of us don't get to plant that break in our season. And a lot of people spend the entire time, whether they know it or not, reacting to the entire day. From the moment you start, you're reacting. I'm reacting to an email I just got. And then that email leads me to my next thing, which leads me to my next thing, which leads me, and then by the end of the day, you didn't have control of anything. So what did you really accomplish? And how are you supposed to feel fulfilled at the end of the day with that? You might sustain for a while, but after a few months to a few years of that, good luck, you know? And good luck growing a business with that kind of planning ahead. You know, you're never going to grow your business reacting. It's one of those things. So now that we know what can happen, right? What is preventing us from doing it? Part of it is planning. Planning's a huge part, you know. Yeah. But a lot of that has to do with priorities. Priorities. Fear. I know people it's not a matter of most agents not knowing they need to be making calls and knocking on doors or whatever it is, but I think it's fear that's preventing most of them from doing it. I'd be willing to wager. So why are we afraid of either growth or... Why, why do we put so much emphasis on other people, I guess? That's a great question. I think the fear comes from lack of confidence and knowledge to do what you want to do. And I think that uh, a lot of people get into the business uh, because they it, it's something that was easy to do. Easy, and they think the rewards are very, very high in relationship to the effort put in, yep. and they're so wrong. But they can, <laughs> they can, they can locate a flip, get all of the work done in forty-five minutes, like they do on TV. Yeah, and and we don't see the work that actually goes in behind it. Yeah, the reality yeah. is not presented like it really is. So yeah. a lot of times they come into the business, and the first dose of reality is the fact that they don't get paid. And then all of a sudden, they start hearing, well, this has to be done, and this has to be done. Um, and, and, and I don't know how to, ch how to change that around. I don't, I'm not even sure people will understand what is necessary, because they don't even, they wouldn't even understand a lot of the words or the phrases that are used in real estate until you actually get trained. Mm -hmm. And so whenever you go through and you get your training and you pass your test, then all of a sudden... You're, you're there, and you're just starting as a baby realtor. Uh, and you still don't know what it's going to take. Yeah. And so they've, they've made their commitment to move into real estate without really understanding it, and I'm not so sure there's an easy way to try to, to resolve that. Yeah. I think that's a hiccup a lot of agents have, too, when you get started per pertaining to the mindset, is being able to make that transition from what you expected it to be to what it is. Are you still willing to do it? I think that, I think a lot of agents, when it boils down to it, it's not what they were expecting. And it may not be their cup of tea. Well, they could, they'll walk in and say, figuratively, to the brokerage, okay, do you have a property I can flip right now without <laughs> without having to find it and find somebody to buy it? And Don't you have like 30 homes that are 30% below market value if you just come in right now? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, where's the team that I can just hire on and I'll make all of the profit, you know, myself without doing any of the work. But that's the impression that they get on TV. Yeah. And that's the impression they get from a lot of the seminars they go to. That's true. Yeah. But, and that's where, coming back, we, it's not, it's not the glamorous thing most people think it is, and by any means. But it is certainly awesome in its own way. You know, for a lot of people, uh, I wouldn't trade not having to go to a office or a cubicle day after day after day after day. I mean, we have one. Yes, you need to be using it. Absolutely. But we get to go show homes. And not only that, but we get to show homes all over the valley. Big homes, small homes. We get to help a lot of different people. We get to negotiate on different levels. We get to actually find niches. You know, if you like talking on phones, talk on phones. If you love knocking on doors, knock on doors. If you want to do open houses, great. If you're great with businesses, do a B2B business. If you're, um, there, oh, there's so many different niches you could tackle. You know, uh, friends and family. I, I know several social butterflies that sell hundreds of homes because they've just, any person that's ever come into their life has become a friends and family. And they've just never let anybody go. So now their database is 7,000 people. And 
they will never let anybody go that they ever meet. And it's just neat, right? But they work hard to keep them, <laughs> to make sure that they are their realtor, to never let them go. You know, they provide huge service because they pride themselves on that. You know, Callow the Callaways, how their service first is wonderful. You know, there's a lot of great things you can do in real estate and impacting people on a huge level. It may not be the glamorous, easy job, but all things being equal, would you rather go to some corporate company for 40 hours a week? Or can you control yourself to create your own business using that same 40 hours a week doing this stuff? Pretty sure when people go to um, wherever it is they work, there's parts of that business they hate doing too. But they have a boss there that makes sure they do it. And they kind of just struggle through it because that's their job. In real estate, that's what we're talking about is how do you get that, that motivation as if you have your boss behind you, but instead it has to be that win. You know, or the fear of loss. Well, I'll be homeless in two months if I don't make this sale. But then you get commission breath. That's not a good place to be either. Mindset has everything to do with it. If you're anticipating the sale, if you're anticipating the win, if you're excited to do what you need to do, even though you may not like it at the time, that overcomes everything. So, coming back to it then, so fear, you know, we were talking about what prevents us from doing it. Um... Now, how can we overcome those things? So, training, obviously. If you don't know what to say, training is good. You know, practicing. Uh, how many people are comfortable role-playing in front of people? How many people are comfortable standing in front of a mirror? Hi, this is Josh Ezell, blah, 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 blah. Oh, man, did I just? Okay, can't do that. All right. Hi, this is Josh Ezell. And, 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 you know, it's embarrassing. It really is. <laughs> but you get through it and that's what makes it fun and before you know it you you just work your way through it and you get the rewards but you had to get through that little uncomfortable phase right so training I'm willing to say that that's you know huge so what's some other things I don't think that there's any way of, uh, of learning the business without simply doing it somehow and you practice it like you were just saying, and uh, ever how you figure out the uh, the best way for you to practice it, it's still going to require some of the same training. So it's it's a matter of setting the priorities and, and just getting it done. And mentoring is another way of uh, yeah. Of making I think support. A big yes. If you are fortunate enough as a startup agent connect yourself with a mentor, that's a huge thing. Yeah. Having, um, teaming up with somebody who has the experience uh, and seeing what they do. You know, who, who was it that said, uh, you know, don't recreate the will. If you find somebody that has the success, do what they do, you'll have what they have. And so there's a lot of successful agents out there who would love to share because there are plenty of sales to go around. And that's another mindset. Are people in the mindset of scarcity? You know, the economy sucks. The world's falling apart. Rah, 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 rah. You know, or are you in the mindset, this is the best market we've ever had. We're actually higher than 2008, you know, 7, 8, whatever it was. And we can, there are so many homes. We have how many millions of people here in the Valley? And we sell 9,000 homes a month or whatever. And that's, that's plenty of sales. I know I could grab four or five of those a month, no problem. You know, there's 30,000 agents, yes. How many of them are actually selling? There's plenty of room for many, for agents who are motivated to sell. There's no loss. Uh, Greg Harrelson's group, uh, I think they're one of the highest I've seen as far as not being a full-blown, quote-unquote, broke rich. They sell 2,400 homes in a year. He has several agents on his team who sell over 100 homes a year. His average agent sells 29 or 28, something like that. Uh, somehow we need to be able to to prepare a new agent for, uh, for what the reality is. Whenever they hear that there are 30,000 agents, then all of a sudden they go, what? You know, but 30,000 agents and 95% of them are inactive. They might hear that there are 9,000 homes. So what do you mean only 9,000 homes? Well, 
they're comparing it to the 30,000 agents, and now all of a sudden they're questioning themselves. Yeah. So probably the mentoring thing that can reinforce encouragement and value and you can do it will be probably one of the, the most yeah. powerful things because in this kind of business or any kind of a sales business that requires stick to but especially in real estate, you could be high in the morning and you can be crashed by midday emotionally uh, if you're not careful. Yep. So you have to have somebody on your shoulder, the mentor or a, a group, uh, a team of some kind of yeah. uh, to, to keep you encouraged. Yeah, and Greg McDaniel, um, love him and his team. You know, they spend a lot of time on the phone themselves and uh, they go out of their way when they get a really difficult phone call that they turn around and they high five each other because they're that much closer to getting to the next one so they actually almost go out of their way to um, well he does go for no but going for the no makes you excited for that because you know it only takes this many no's to get to the yes and so go you know I think it was like go F yourself and die or something like that is what the person said and they immediately jumped up yeah right on woohoo and then jumped right back on the phones and immediately got an appointment right immediately following because they didn't let them phase it most people would have been devastated by somebody telling you to go F off and die but they take a high five and woohoo it talk about change in mindset talk about anticipating the victory <laughs> and making sure you're going to get it. It's awesome. So, personally, everybody has their own thing. And so, you, you can only answer that truly. What will it take for you to overcome it? Is it getting that training? Finding that mentor? Just buckling down? Is it creating your morning routine? Is it sticking to it? Not letting things that pop up that seem to be so important right now, but aren't. You know, most everything can has its time and its place. And most things that we think are important today and right now aren't really. Um, okay, so once we know what we can do to overcome, what are we willing to do? And it's not something, are you going to do it Monday? You know, it's, what are we doing right now? You know, what can we do that one thing? Can it, when should it start? Should it be doing? Should it be done right now? Can we do it right now? I think the first thing is go ahead and put your plan of action together, put your goals in place, and uh, have them in writing where you can review them, keep them in front of you at all times, and uh, put your plan together to reach those goals and uh, put them in action. Yeah. So find your one thing, and then let's. Buckle down and actually do it. So um, this is actually going to be yeah, pretty quick training today. I was hoping for but right about an hour if all went well. But just wanted to start off the year right. And instead of having a two-hour-long first meeting, I know many of us are already thinking about, okay, we need to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And so for the next hour between, it's almost 11 o'clock here in Arizona, between 11 and 12, Let's figure out exactly what we can do and start doing it. If you know you needed to be making calls this week and haven't, there you go. You have an hour. Pick up the Just pick up the phone and start making calls. It doesn't matter who you call. It doesn't matter if you're great at it on your first one. Just start doing it. If you haven't done an open house this week, grab some signs and go do an open house. If you need to knock on doors, go knock on doors. If you haven't put together your database because you're scared or whatever, overcome that fear. There are so many sales to be had. We're in the best real estate market pretty much ever. Our average sale is over 240000 here in um, here in the Phoenix area. And that is significantly higher than it was in the quote-unquote peak. We have more people that are looking to buy homes and sell homes, and we do not have the supply. We, right now, is the best market, and we are starting off 2018 with this best market. Let's all take advantage of it, and let's make sure we have our best year ever. No excuses. Right on. Let's do it.
That's it. Yeah. So, another question. Sir.